Hello, Good folks. Evening. Nice background. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> <clears throat> hey, Zafar, you are the famous ZS from Amsterdam, isn't it? Yeah, correct. Nice to see <laughs> you in real. <laughs> same, same, same here. From the Thunder. same neighborhood as I am. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, we never met each other, by the way. We have a night uh, here in the beauty of uh, Peter. I hear you perfect, yes. Zafar. I hear you perfect, Zafar. <laughs> <laughs> This is Peter talking, and you know that you can ignore Peter, you, uh, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I should speak in English. This, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, Burak, nice to have you here. Hello, thank you, Sandra. I'm really looking forward to your, pro uh, to your presentation. Thank you very much. And I hope it's all that I think it will be. And then I'm pretty, pretty confident that it will be awesome. It is what I hope as well. For sure, it's going to be awesome. Hello, Rock. Hello, everyone. This is Sarah speaking. Hello, welcome, Sarah. Uh, Burak, do you do you just want to start, or do you want me to introduce you? Yeah, you can maybe do a small introduction about IT Gilde yeah. first, then maybe about me, then I can take over. Sander. Okay, I will do a two minute introduction. Uh, I am reputed for, uh, for being very strict in time. So I will uh, start at, uh, at seven o'clock sharp. Oh, I think you are pushing your, your slides, isn't it? Yeah. Shall I stop it? No, that's okay. I'm just rearranging screens to see if as uh, an attendee, I can also get this nice window where I see everybody. I like that very much. Yeah, I couldn't manage this, so is it? If you have two screens, you can. You yeah, can I have two screens now, so I see the the little icons with everybody. Nice Golden Gate background, by the way, Burak. Have you been there? Uh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe this will be a stepping stone to be there. <laughs> yes, you never know. I will be back there in two weeks. I am so excited. I haven't been there for two years. Yeah, because of COVID, I guess, right? You, are, you were going there regularly for course yes. recording, right? Before COVID, I went there five, six times a year for recording. Then COVID struck and I created a home studio. And I haven't been in San Francisco since uh, since March 13th, 2020, when Donald Trump suddenly decided to, cl to close the borders. Yeah. Can you imagine I was sitting there in my hotel and enjoying my evening cocktail? And then I was Donald Trump. We are going to close the border. I didn't even finish my cocktail. And I was with KLM on the phone for half an hour. I want to get home. Have you got the last <laughs> flight out? Well, it was not the last flight. Uh, yeah, I think it was the last flight, uh, in fact. Yeah. Otherwise, you would have been stuck there for uh, a few weeks or not? Yeah, well, I would have bought a kayak and pedaled my way back to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Hi folks. Hi Sandra, hi Peter. Oh, what time is it? It is uh, one minute before start. Hey Michael, nice to have you here. Good to be here. Great subject. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. You mean nice people? <laughs> of course. <laughs> We can't come with a weak subject. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Your time is too precious, Michael. <laughs> Do you know Michael Burak? No, uh, Peter, oh. he a little bit mentioned. Ah, okay. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> All right, Burak you. is uh, top of the hour, so I am going to kick off. And after that, it is all yours. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sander van Vught, and uh, I am a partner in IT Gilde together with Peter Isabout. Uh, and today uh, I am proud to have somebody from uh, my network present for IT Gilde. Uh, his name is uh, Burak uh, Kansi, Kansi Soglu. I hope I pronounced it all right. You are Perfect. going to do that better for yourself. And uh, I'm all excited about the topic that he is going to explain about CICD pipelines to deploy uh, applications in Kubernetes. So Burak, the only thing that I want to say, thank you so much uh, for being willing to present and uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Sander. Also providing me this opportunity, it is, I am glad to be here, all with this nice audience. If you have any questions, meanwhile, Please don't hesitate to ask. So uh, it will be around one hour, but maybe in the demo time, it, it can take longer. Today, uh, our agenda is, as you already know, Kubernetes, because everyone is talking about, and everyone wants to use somehow. But the difficulty is starting with, of course, different platforms like on-premise environments and cloud. Uh, between all these, the conflicts, we have also a problem how we, we are going to deploy an application in a production manner or in an automated way. So we will look at the picture from different aspects. I hope you will enjoy today. Our agenda for today, what is CICD? Yeah, before starting this, uh, today I want to get agree on the uh, common terms because it might change uh, and we can uh, get different meaning from that. And at least I want to set the ground first. So second, in the second topic, we will go, what is Kubernetes? We will look at a small architectural overview. Then we will look at uh, what is the problem with the Kubernetes world, what we are facing now in the enterprise world. Then we will introduce the GitOps concept. Uh, it is a new emerging concept to deploy applications in Kubernetes. Then uh, we will give you an example uh, with using GitOps and some kind of tools. Also, this will help us to manage this environment. Uh, of course, as a prerequisite, if you have some kind of basic understanding of Linux, Linux and also containerization Kubernetes, it will help and you will get much more benefit from this session. So now your speaker, who am I? Uh, I have around 13, 14 years experience in IT. I am a pure engineer, computer engineer, and I have done my master in management. But currently for the last years, I am trying to specialize in cloud and DevOps area. Now let's look at the common terms and how we will explain CI, CD. What is the meaning for you and what is the meaning for me? We will first start with continuous integration. What is continuous integration? So there is a developer. A developer is getting a task after planning session. Then uh, he or she needs to implement this uh, planning task. So once he done his development, then he will push all the changes to the repository. But this pushing changes to the repository 
it will help us also to integrate what is done for that specific task. So in, in this continuous integration step or flow, let's say, what we want to achieve for that specific task, we want to build that specific task and then afterwards integrate with the existing code base we have. So after integration, we want to also perform some kind of test. It can be, of course, beginning uh, with unit testing, then also some kind of also integration testing we will do. So in continuous integ integration, what we want to achieve always, whatever there is a commit in the code repository, it should trigger a build. And uh, according to Uncle Martin, it's this integration should take at most 10 minutes. So in 10 minutes, a developer should get a notification if it is successful or failure, mostly if it is failure. Then, of course, these results and also metrics regarding this continu continuous integration, how long did it take, all, all the tests are passed or not, and these results should be pushed to our uh, continuous integration metric system. We, with this way, we have a nice visibility. So we have a nice visibility what is going on in our development environment. And whatever is changed in developer side, it is get built and integrated and tested as well. Uh, at the end of this flow, we are getting an artifact. This artifact should be releasable and it should work. That is the must in our side. So what is continuous delivery on other side? In continuous integration, we are triggering a build. Uh, we are compiling a code for high level languages. Maybe we need to compile also low level languages and we need to do uh, run our integration test, some unit test. But in continuous delivery, so here we are getting our code. If you look at the flow, the, on the left bottom side, you will see continuous integration. So developers pushing a code change and this code change will trigger uh, push events in Git repository. And this Git repository will trigger continuous integration flow. So in the continuous integration flow, we need to have some kind of releasable artifact. So in continuous delivery, we are continuing our journey. So we should continue because releasing artifact, yes, it is good. We have something to deploy, but at the end, this artifact needs to propagate it to the different environments we have. These environments, usually testing environment, uh, staging environment, pre prod or uh, production. So this number of environments and the size of environments usually is going to change with your company size, uh, the project where you are building, or how many environments we have. These are all changing based on your project and uh, your location also, the resource, the total resource, money resource, human resource. But usually, typically, or we have at least two environments, so non-production and production. Between this journey, when we are stepping stone, with different environment, in continuous delivery, we are also performing tests. These tests can be automated, but also manual as well. In continuous delivery journey, if when we are going to production, if this journey is stopped with the manual approval, we say, yes, this is continuous delivery, but without manual approval, if we are continue our promotion and propagation to the higher environment, then we call this term continuous deployment. So this need, why we need this? Because in the enterprise world, uh, if business has some idea, uh, what they want, they want from development team or project team immediately going to market. So they want to test the new features immediately. We are building this continuous flow integration plus delivery or deployment because of business needs, because business needs to act quickly. Like what happened with Corona, uh, what happened with pandemic, uh, every business mindset and all the things are changing frequently. 
this is the idea to release. So what we want to achieve, we want to improve our lead time. So business has a concept and this concept is discussed with the business analyst, technical analyst, or they did a survey. Then we are building our team. We are doing this in a sprint cycle and we are giving this to our operations engineer or cloud engineer to deploy different environments and also promote these services workloads to different environments. Meanwhile, as I said, we are doing end to end test. Then our customer is getting this product or service. From that point, we are getting feedback from customer or we have already some kind of tools to check how customer is using our service or product. So we need also business metrics in our application as well as we have infrastructure metrics we are following which services are being called, how many times, which services are getting HTTP 200, 400, 500, what is the usage behavior in the daily time, what is our peak time. Then we are providing all these feedback to the business again. Okay, how it is, where it is started, how it is going. So with, with this loop, they can see how it is going, they can test the market, they can change the business ideas also in real time because we have this flow. With this flow, our business is more powerful. So, now the Kubernetes. The topic is Kubernetes. Why we need Kubernetes? If we want to get this agility and this speed, we need to break our walls. We need to break also our applications. We are breaking our applications into small pieces. And that small pieces, they can work in virtual machine or bare metal. But the problem is, if they work in the virtual machine and bare metal, Booting a bare metal or VM, or booting an operating system take minutes. Cloning an operating system take minutes. Snapshot take minutes. So to get this agility and this speed, after to be able to break our monolithic applications, we are putting them into container one by one because this technology is helping us to package our application, whatever they need, uh, it is the application binary, application configuration, the code itself, and the other third-party library. With this packaging, like in the real container world, in the real container world, the factory is producing goods, whatever it is, then they are packing into container, and the container is loaded, transported between different destinations without opening the case. So that is what we want to do. Once a developer develops something, we want to pack it in a container. And if it is working in his computer, then say good part. But the, the other problem is, if we separate it into multiple pieces, then also we have other issues because <laughs> how we will uh, move these multiple containers and who will take carry all these containers across all our setups. So if we attach a volume, uh, if that volume is gone, or if the container host dies, where should we schedule these containers? Or if we have multiple kind of same copies, how we will load balanced external requests to those copies? So we need in this multi-container world, some kind of orchestration tool and this should get all the heavy lifting from us. Why? Because we have on-premise environment, cloud environment. We have different networking storage capabilities, uh, technology stack in our production. So we want to make abstraction all over platform. And without looking what is underlying infrastructure, we want to deploy our application. So 
And we want to deploy all these containers because I want to deploy them as a container. But the problem is now, what I will do with hundreds or thousands of containers? That is the issue. Then, of course, when Docker uh, announced in 2013 and 14, they always focused on developer aspect. But Google also want to get a big stake on cloud. So they were really ready to get this train on with this kind of innovation. So they were working on it already. But Tucker itself as a company, they never thought uh, this kind of enterprise. So because in enterprise, we are not running containers one by one or terminating one by one. We have hundreds of applications. Then at that time, Google came with this solution because this was already a, a best practice or they were already more or less operating in their data center. Nobody has this kind of load in the world. They have, and they innovate. A couple of engineers in Google, on top of Tucker, they built this open source container orchestration platform. It is announced in uh, PyCon 2014, but the first release was July 2015. So in this multi-container world, the most famous container orchestration platform is Kubernetes because it takes a high stake. Uh, it is developed mainly by Google, but now in the community wise, Red Hat, uh, VMware, IBM, there, there are also many other companies committing to this repository and we have a CNCF foundation around it. And what is the architecture, Kubernetes architecture? How they uh, designed and built it? In the Kubernetes architecture, so we have a brain site. It is on the left-hand side, master nodes we have. In master nodes, we have different components. And on the right-hand side, we have worker nodes. So master nodes are responsible for managing the cluster itself and also all our workloads. Usually as a DevOps user or cloud user or developer, you are interacting with your kubectl CLI or you can use some kind of dashboarding tool and all the requests will go through the kube API server. Here in, in the master node, kube API server is responsible for managing all the requests, authentication, authorization and admission controller. At CD, uh, Kubernetes itself is a stateless machine or a big machine, but for cluster configuration or for other configuration, he needs to keep some bookkeeping, housekeeping, and that is done with the etcd in memory key value pair. And of course, you can get a Kubernetes in a managed service way. So for managed hosted services, Kubernetes API is also providing cloud controller provider. So it is for them to manage Kubernetes master nodes easily. The controller manager, it is a, like in the embedded design we have, controller manager is a dead loop. It is always looping to check the what is the status, what is the status. Instead of keeping the last status, it is always checking in an infinite loop. Scheduler is responsible for um, scheduling our containers. In Kubernetes world, it is pot one to many containers. It is the atomic unit. Scheduler is responsible for scheduling these workloads to the worker nodes. Who is most better fit, then he will schedule it. He will schedule those workloads. And DNS, in Kubernetes master site, we need an internal DNS for services and for reaching other components. And if you look at under dying layer, we have to connect all these master nodes, worker nodes, uh, with this seamless networking and storage plugin. Yeah, choosing managed Kubernetes or your own Kubernetes is the first choice. The second choice is which network plugin are you going to use? And the third choice is which storage plugin are you going to use? So network plugin, it is possible with CNI and storage with CSI. It is network plugin, CNI is already 
quite mature, but CSI is, uh, vendors are really working on that. So master node for production, we recommend at least five nodes. And in worker node, you can go up to 5,000. You can go more, but the service will deg degrade. So on the left-hand side, we have control plane. We call it control plane. Right-hand side, where we are running our workloads, we call it data plane. In data plane, we are scheduling our applications. This is what is responsible for. Now, how we can define resources in Kubernetes? In Kubernetes, if we want to deploy something, it is based on always a definition, based on a definition. So on the left-hand side, on bottom, you can see we have different resource categories. And on these resource categories, you can do basic CRUD operations, create, update, get, and delete. If you want to deploy something like here, I have a simple pod definition. Um, you have to define according to API reference. It is always API version, kind, metadata, and spec. You cannot put whatever you want. You have to rely on really this API reference that I gave you also in this slide. According to your Kubernetes version, whatever resource you want to define, you want to define based on this API reference. Otherwise, it will shout and it will say this is invalid. So, but the thing is, the journey is starting. with here. Okay, in Kubernetes, I have multiple workload type, and I have to define everything with a YAML file, with declaration file. First, if I want to deploy some application, I have to decide which workload type is my application is fitting. It is the ultimate question. So it is like you have a car, and how many people you have, and how many people see it in the car? You cannot get more people in that, in that car if it is four seat or five seat. So you know your application yourself and you have a destination. The destination is Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, we have five different workload type that you can define and deploy your application. So you have to decide what is best. Usually the generic one, it is deployment. Okay, you decided, perfect. Then. According to this definition, we put this declaration uh, into our YAML pool. Just keep it. The second thing, do we need to expose this service or not? Yes. Then, okay, we have to decide the service. Also, if we need to expose the outside, we need ingress. Okay. We have a couple of YAML files again. Put it in the YAML pool. The third thing, do we have an external configuration or secret, do we need some persistency? Yes, we have to decouple our application from what is going on. At least the lifecycle independences should be separated because I can deploy application separate and I can also deploy all the application configuration around and separate. They should not be together. So if you decouple them, then of course you have multiple YAML files. The last but not least, you need also some cluster configuration. You cannot deploy an application directly. Yeah, for your development in your laptop, it is easy. Just kubectl, then done. But in enterprise world, we cannot run direct command on the cluster we have because if I am running kubectl create, if Sunder is coming with kubectl delete, there is no audit. Somebody has to track which kind of YAML file we have and who is changing which resource. That is the issue. This is our problem now with the Kubernetes. Now, for deploying an application, I need at least six or seven YAML file. That is the problem. But the other problem is in environment, enterprise world, I will have different clusters. So 
I have to keep also this cluster configuration consistent because in the cluster configuration, I have basic infrastructure configuration, plus I have network, maybe also security configuration. So I have to keep all these configurations somewhere. I have to keep my configuration files, all these YAML files. Then I have to, I want some kind of audit tracking. So who is changing what? I want this visibility. And I want this consistency also across different environments. The problem didn't change, but we talk, we talk, we gave the definition CI CD, okay. But now we have to do this with Kubernetes. The problem didn't change. I want to do the same thing, same patterns. I want to follow same patterns. I want to get speed, but I choose this Kubernetes as a container orchestration solution. But now I have problem with YAML inflation, YAML explosion, and also with multiple cluster configuration issues. This is the current problem. If you select Kubernetes as a, your target environment, then this is your next problem. So why we are gathered today to address this issue? This issue was also emerging while Kubernetes was going to live in the enterprise market. It is first announced as a term uh, by the WaveWorks founder, uh, Alexis Richardson. So in his couple of blog posts in WaveWorks, uh, I think technical blog, he said, we need this kind of structure to move our application. Uh, otherwise it will be not manageable for developers or for also operations. So what is GitOps? In GitOps, we are storing all these declarations, cluster configuration, application configuration, all these YAML files that we need to deploy our application to Kubernetes, all these YAML files that we created, then uh, we are putting them in Git because Git already proved itself many years. Why we are using, yeah, you can ask why we are using Git, but my counter question is to you, why we are not using Git? Because in Git, each, each commit can be traced, detected, reviewed, and audited. So if I change a YAML file, if Sander didn't like, he can do Git revert. Then with Git revert, the cluster should get the old configuration, but we will talk about how it can be done. Mainly, we are putting Git technology into the center because it is providing us all the flexibility. We have a history, we can audit, we can see who is changed, and we can see also review. We can create review, we can ask review, and we can do revisions on the infrastructure, on the application, with using software methodologies that we built for the many years. It is what we want to do. Of course, uh, choosing your Git structure is different. It is also changing according to your company strategy. Somebody, uh, you can say, we choose monorepo, we like monorepo, or we like long live branches, only one or two. So on the right hand side, you can find also in the Google, it is a famous example. So we have, uh, while putting our configuration file, we have to determine this structure. Where we will put, maybe you can go with the single monorepo, then you can create different folders, different for each application, for each application environment, or you can create multi-repo per repo per application. <clears throat> the structure you have to decide. So we put, Git into the center. We decided our Git branching strategy and how we will place all the Kubernetes cluster we have, all the applications we have. So you should create a mapping. Clusters, applications, and configurations. And based on that, you should select uh, what is best for you in the Git structure, branching structure. So if you look at high level view, then, of course, if we define this structure, 
somebody has taken care of this structure, right? Uh, yeah, I defined this structure, but so what, right? Who will read this structure? Who will work on this structure? Am I going to work or somebody is going to work for me? Then we need another tool. So I did structuring. I put all my YAML files in the Git according to my company strategy. So I need some kind of tool. I am not giving a name. This tool should start with cloning this configuration repository. <laughs> this is the first. Then it should grab all the manifest file that I put in this Git repository for that application. Then the third step is it should work on these manifest files, maybe parameterized or tokenized, what you just, you name it. Then it should apply these changes. I need a tool. In the industry now, it's this tool called GitOps tool or GitOps operator. And Kubernetes operator is also a recent term. It is also developed by Reddit. So operator means it is working like an ops engineer and it is doing all the ops engineer task for deploying, uh, deploying and keeping consistency of the application. So I need some kind of tool. It should do all these high level activity for me. And this tool should be smart. Then he will connect the pieces. So how we will put the CI CD into the Kubernetes? This is the structure, maybe ideal structure. So developer is on the left bottom side. He changes the code, then this code change triggers a build in CI system. For the CI system, continuous integration system, you can use whatever you tool you want, like Jenkins is open source one or uh, GitLab or other enterprise third party tools with license you can also use. But in continuous integration, what we want to do, the commit is taken, we build our application, we run unit test integration test, then we are, as we said, we, we need to package our application in a container so now we introduce a step for creating an image and pushing this image to the image registry. Yeah. So then if you want, you can do scanning, vulnerable scanning on these images. Then at the end, this trigger, it should trigger, uh, uh, it should trigger our uh, manifest file, so it should change our manifest file. And what we suggest here, as you can see, these are in different colors, but that is on purpose. The best practice is keeping your code repository and config repository separate. Because we can give different permissions to different people, it will be easy also for us to isolate from each other. So in this config repository, we have our manifest files. In continuous integration flow, at the end of continuous integration flow, we have a successful image that is passed all the tests, that is passed all the vulnerability scanning, and we know the image name, image tag. Then we update our manifest file. As soon as this manifest file is updated, somebody is listening on this config repository. Who is listening? Our smart GitOps operator. He is listening to this repository. Ah, it is change. Now it is time to apply this change. How it will apply? Of course, the smartness of GitOps operator will decide and our mapping as well it will decide because I have to map the application, where it will go, which version and which cluster. This cluster can be in cloud or in premise, in on-prem also. So, What you will see in the market, 
this GitOps tool, it can recite in your target cluster, but you can also put uh, a separate Kubernetes cluster dedicated for it outside of it, and it can push also to different clusters. You don't need to keep your uh, GitOps operator in every cluster. You can keep it only one location, but of course you need to give permission. And in each step, it will follow up all journey. So rest, it is not my job. My job is creating an image. Then the rest, delivery part or deployment part is in the hands of my Git's op operator. So, this is the summary. Uh, what I said, code repo activity triggers this continuous integration, but config repo activity triggers either continuous delivery, also continuous deployment. So this is the basic breakdown and what we expect from GitOps operator. So, but now, which kind of problem I have? I have different environments. I have multiple YAML files. So I need to parameterize, <laughs> if possible, all these YAML files. So all these templates needs to be parameterized. So I, I should be able to inject different parameters, configurations based on the target location. So for this purpose, you need to use a templating tool. It can be Helm, it can be JSONnet, JSONnet, customize, or you can use your own scripting logic. That is okay. It is what I need in templating because otherwise, if you are trying to build a YAML file for each application, a separate YAML file, let's say, for each application for different environments, then of course you have a YAML explosion again. The other tool I need in our site, I need a GitOps operator tool that I need to deploy in my Kubernetes environment. Currently, uh, the famous ones, Argo CD and Flask. So today in the demo, after this presentation, we will go Argo CD. And what I need as well, the Kubernetes itself, babysitting of Kubernetes is very difficult because Kubernetes layer architecture, you have seen all the components. It is not easy to manage, get it up and running for one environment. And just imagine when you have multiple Kubernetes clusters and in those clusters, <laughs> you have hundreds of applications. So as an admin, I need one pan glass view. What is happening in my Kubernetes environment? For this, do I need to run a couple of commands? I need some kind of dashboard even above what the default dashboarding can provide for me. So if this tool is smart, it should also take care of this kind of dashboarding for me. And if it is really smart, if I change something in manifest file, it should immediately take and apply, but the other way around also, vice versa. If there's a change in the cluster, maybe I'm a naughty boy, I change, I delete something in real time in cluster with an imperative command directly on the cluster, but it is not same with the, what it's configured on Git. The Git is single source of truth. So this GitOps tool is giving me 100% guarantee. I will take care. You don't need to worry. I will make sure what is configured in the Git for this application, it is valid all the time. So today also, uh, what we want to do, we want to show you Argo CD. Why? Uh, it is not built by Waveworks, but from another company. Waveworks, <laughs> the one who put these terms, jargons to the market, they develop Flux. Uh, but you can also use in a combination. They are complementary, or you can use only one tool if you don't want to go also tool inflation in your sign. Uh, but in Argo CD, we have enterprise ready features. We have SSO integration. We have multi-tenant project support. 
uh, RBAC role based authentication proto protocol and you can easily see on the UI <coughs> what is the changes in the system and uh, what is going on in project level in application level and also uh, individual component levels and you can also customize these behaviors with different kind of hooks now demo uh, we have a small demo. Uh, in this demo, you, we need some kind of tool. So how you can achieve what I what I'm going to show here. Uh, on AWS, I have Elastic Kubernetes cluster. I followed Quick Start Guide. It following Quick Start Guide and opening an AWS account for yourself. Also, you can get achieve the same cluster if you want. Uh, then, of course, after having a Kubernetes cluster, you need to install this Argo CD. So for this Argo CD, you need to create a different namespace, a dedicated namespace. We are using namespace in Kubernetes for isolating resources from each other. And Argo CD requires a dedicated namespace. So Argo CD is a GitOps tool, and we are going to install this GitOps operator tool in our cluster. So you have to follow these instructions. And <laughs> after installing Argo CD, you have to get the admin password. And if you are lucky, and if you expose correctly, this Argo CD will be available for you. The third tool uh, in the structure we are using, Customize. The Customize is the templating tool. As we said, you can use Helm. You can use JSONnet, JSONnet, customize, or your own, own best scripting, Python scripting, uh, to parameterize and tokenization of all these YAML files we need for because we have multiple applications, multiple environments, multiple clusters. I need a parameterization, and that parameterization template. Uh, I need some kind of templating tool. So in this demo, I I, I have done my choice based on customize. What is the architecture? So uh, some part of the integration uh, not completed yet, so bear with me. <laughs> As you know, DevOps is always integration, but this is what we want to achieve and this is what we want to sell as an idea. It should be uh, like this in a normal enterprise way. So in continuous integration, I have chosen this technology as Jenkins. And in the repo site, I am using GitLab and Jenkins and GitLab hosted by myself. So developer, as an application here in this demo, we will use a Spring Pet Clinic. It's a sample Java project. It is published in Spring GitHub folder. So I'm not using different project. Uh, you can easily follow what I am doing here. And if I change something in the code, <laughs> it should trigger a build. And after integration done on the Spring Pet Cleaning project, we are running test. Then if the test is passing, we are pushing and creating our image in the container image registry. As a container image registry, I have chosen uh, Docker Hub. Then here we are updating our manifest file. And of course, the Argo CD, it will help us to deploy this and change the environment in, on AWS for us. Let's see uh, if all the things are wired or not. I have... So uh, this is
This is pet clinic. Wait, I will delete. Just give me time. I I want to clean my screen. I have another drawing tool, and this is causing this line. I can't get rid of this. Okay, so I have here a pet clinic project hosted in GitLab environment. So in this pet clinic project, normally uh, you can reach this project uh, from if you search on Google Spring Pet Clinic. This is the project I am using. This is simple Java application under Spring projects you can see. But what I have added here, uh, normally this is not inside this in this project. So for building a Docker image, we have a Docker file. And in Docker file, it is very small Docker file. We are creating a separate uh, username and group. That is the best practice as well for running non-root application. And we are exposing our service on 8080. Then we are starting our application. This is Docker file. And what I have added as well for my developer development or for my own purpose running locally, I have added Docker Compose. And this Docker Compose is basically getting up and running the image itself and also a database. So it is a two, you can say it's a two tier application. We have a front end and back end. Back end is a database and front end. Uh, is like this. So it is finding pets, finding uh, uh, pet doctors around it. So who is owning which pet? This is simple application. And all this data pulled from this database section. So we have this configuration in GitLab. And if you go to Jenkins, I was playing with this in Jenkins. We will use this as a continuous integration. So we have a basic pipeline here. We are checking out, building, testing, creating and publish image, and we are triggering our configuration repository. So let's look at here. The pipeline itself is triggered with the, all the changes in the GitHub repository, GitLab repository we have. So, and this is the basic pipeline we have. Let me put also in bigger aspects. We are defining environment variables in this pipeline. Then in the first stage, we are checking out code and with the Maven we are building. And in the second stage in the pipeline, we are building code and we are pushing all the test reports to publish somewhere else. And in the third step, we are creating an Im image, as you can see. But what we are doing, this is also best practice. If you want to do in Kubernetes world, if you want to track what is going on, uh, you have to really good, you have to tag correctly, you have to label correctly. In the cloud world, you need these uh, labeling, tagging, image tagging, resource tagging, labeling is, you have to do it correctly. You have to play games with the rules. Otherwise, it will be difficult to track all these pods, containers scattered around without proper label tag on it. So what we are doing here, then once we build the image, uh, we are tagging to, according to our target location, but here we are using image and this image is our application name version is we are getting it from our application version syntax or whatever is described here if you go to application definition in the application definition in java as you know all the dependency configuration for maven world or for gradle world we are using pom and in the pom we have artifact id this is basically your workload name and the application version you can use this you can rely on this so in the, in the Jenkins pipeline for integration, I am also relying this configuration because this is valid. This is pushed by my developer. 
And I am using this for tagging. And what I add as well, git commit. So I know for which commit this image belongs to. And based on this, I will update my config repository. I will call the other pipeline, trigger Kubernetes config repo. As we said in Git ops, we need at least two repo. One is code repository. So in the code repository, we are following our continuous integration flow. That is what we have done now in Jenkins pipeline. And we are pushing our image to our registry. Then we have to trigger the second repository. In this repository, now I will show you. In this repository, This is the second repository in my hosted GitLab. It is Kubernetes config. As I said, this branching strategy, it is up to your uh, company capability, design, how you are working. It is, it is totally changing. So currently I'm following monorepo strategy and I put my application here, pet cleaning. And in the pet cleaning, uh, we are using for templating tool customize. In customize, you can define a base. So I define a base, like base configuration. I define a base for templating. These are the base template structure that I put. And whatever, if I am using customize for tokenization templating, I have to put <coughs> which resources is going to parse and inject what I will or change something in the existing file. So I point these two YAML files in the base directory because in the base directory, I have uh, pet cleaning itself deployment. We are deploying this pet cleaning solution in Kubernetes as a deployment object type. If you remember, it is one of the workload type we have. And as you can see, the image itself, it is using long name structure. Yeah, you can decide whatever you want as a semantic versioning you can use or version one build number, make it useful and make it long that everyone can understand, okay, this image is belongs to this build or this commit, then I can traverse back. That is what we want to achieve. So I have a base configuration for my templating tool. Then what we have as well, as we said, we have different environments. So in for different environments, I need also different structures. Currently, I have only one development structure. In customized world, we call it overlays. So <laughs> you want to override or you want to add on top of what is configured in base. So in development, what we are adding, we are adding a namespace definition this is the namespace object in Kubernetes you can define. Then we have service definition. So, and in service definition, since I'm operating on AWS, uh, I give also domain name. I am using external DNS operator that is helping me to create uh, DNS records for my service. And I choose the service type as a load balancer. So I have also database. Uh, as I said, it is a two-tier application. And in my database, in underlying layer, I have a persistent volume claim that I am asking to my storage class that is in this case EFS in AWS environment. But you can have different uh, provisioner, storage provisioner. As you, if you remember in our Kubernetes architecture, we have a storage plugin. You can choose the best plugin you want for your needs. So since I'm operating on AWS, I have I did this choice based on EFS and I'm asking 10 gigabyte space. And on top of this, of course, uh, yeah, underlying this, I have persistent volume. And on top of this, I have claim and here in the persistent volume, I have to show uh, the real uh, volume, the real EFS structures, the, the real EFS service that I created earlier. So this is a structure. I have a base configuration. It should apply. Then 
or specific environment or it can be different cluster as well. It is up to you. Yeah, this structure, how you make this GitHub repository, uh, GitLab repository, uh, based on your application, based on your number of clusters, based on your number of environments, it is up to you. Now I have chosen monorepo and overlay structure. So, and this is the application Kubernetes repository site. The other thing, <laughs> and I have an Argo CD. So as I said, this is also one of the installation you have to done in your environment. And in Argo CD, uh, I defined this as an application. So if you go here in my uh, Kubernetes config, config repository, here we defined an application for this GitOps operator. We have chosen Argo CD as our GitOps operator. Now in this operator, I am defining an application. I am telling this GitOps operator, hey, GitOps operator, can you please use this uh, repository, this pet, pet clinic overlays development, and it should be target namespace development. As you can see, I specify as well a cluster. So this cluster can be a different cluster, not, not the necessarily the same cluster, but it can be different cluster, also different place. But meanwhile, what I realized, I have to plug in my uh, charger. It is good. <coughs> so let me connect my charger. This is the structure, just give me a few Okay, uh, so we defined our application in Argo CD. And then once we define our application, it will be appear on this Argo CD as an application. <laughs> and in this Argo CD GitOps tool, we can see application in a one pan glass view. So what is the different components we have? and what are the current status in them. So as you can see, I have a definition, uh, Postgres, and this Postgres, it is the service, and this service is uh, bind to this endpoint. I can see endpoints, I can see all the components. And it is listening on, on the status on this repository. So if you look at the last commit 605 and this, not synced, yeah, 605. So whatever I change here, it will be automatically reflected. And of course, it is a definition of in your side, if you don't want automatic sync, if you want to do manual sync, that is also okay. You can do uh, based on that, <coughs> based on that the sync mechanism will work. And you can also change the healing behavior Argo CD tool is really smart. It will help you if something is broken or if some naughty boys, girls change something in the cluster real time with the imperative commands, it will also try to take Git as a single source of truth and it will try to match what is the desired state in the Git and what is the current state in the cluster. And it will give you this one pan glass view. So, uh, and 
we use uh, I use Docker Hub, but of course uh, each one of here is a decision. Which tool do you want to use, uh, and how you integrate this? Because there are all-in-one solutions. There are also other uh, solutions. They are only focusing on one part. I want to thank you, all of you, for joining this presentation. I hope it was useful for you. Uh, maybe in, in another sessions, we can go more details in how we integrated these all these pieces. And the slides will be available to you if you send email to Peter. Yeah? Yes, that's me. <laughs> Please send your email and your request. And I will publish all this integration work I have done in Jenkins, in other tools, and also other scripts in my uh, GitHub repository on public. Do you have any questions? If I may, Burak, I would like, just like to say thank you very much. Very nice presentation well structured. Uh, I really enjoyed watching it and I'm looking forward to your next presentations. Thank you. Uh, I think in the chat we have one question. Uh, yes, if we have YAML files in Git, yeah, in Git, when we have multiple YAML files, this templating tool customize it is going to help us to change all these configuration. So here in, in the other job I have, update Kubernetes config repository. If you look at this configuration, how I checked and use, I will show you this configuration, how we are updating. This is up to you. Uh, we are using customized tool, and if we get a new image for after CI integration, if it is done successfully, then we are getting a new image. Then I declare this state to my templating tool. Hey, this is the new image. Then it is automatically changing this image. It can be image. It can be also other uh, attribute of all your resource. It doesn't matter because this customized tool it is very powerful. Uh, you can change whatever you want and you can patch. Yeah, in Kubernetes world, we, we call it patching. You can patch your existing resources. It is allowing you to do. I am looking chat if we have other questions not answered. Hello. Hello. I have a question. Yeah, William. Yeah, yes. Um, uh, the the customize uh, you edit uh, locally, right? Edit locally. Yeah, you customize edit set image. Uh, the whole uh, you edit it locally, and then you do the git add dot. So that is to... Um, yeah, first here, we are doing a checkout, William. Yeah. This is checking out our Kubernetes config repository, where our application configuration, all YAML files are residing. Okay? Okay. Then, is, yes. then after checkout, <laughs> since my target is development environment and I want to do continuous integration, and I do change this in the uh, development specific. Yeah, okay. And then, and then you have the command uh, git add dot, eh? that is to store. Yeah, all your, is, uh... yeah. as I said, this git itself is single source of truth. So whatever I am changing here, yeah. I have to add this to the git and I have to push these changes to the git. Yeah, and okay, to git. Uh, push is to the repository you have on, on the GitLab, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay clear. So yeah. this will push, and since this Argo CD is listening this repository, as I showed here, ah, there is a new commit, I have to get the configuration. 
Okay, and you can also compare uh, the all your comments in this. What? Uh, yes, if you <laughs> if you come here here you can see what is live in the environment and what is the desired, what is asked for, and what is the difference. You can see. Ah, in real okay. Time. Okay, that's uh, to compare your previous commit with the current. Yeah, not the previous commit, but the live, the single shot of your cluster, we can see it here. But if you want to see what is change in uh, in your commit, the best place is your Git repository. You can use GitHub, GitLab here in the GitHub. Let's uh, look at this file. And here, if you... If you see the history, I can uh, I can see the history of this file and who is changed what. Okay, but when you click on that, then you see the code. Ah, okay. Then you, you see? see what you've yeah. changed. This, is, this job triggers our Jenkins continuous integration job triggers image change. Then it has changed this configuration in the GitHub repository. So we are using Git as a central tool to see all these changes. Yes, okay. And Argo CD will automatically pick up this and apply to the cluster. You don't need to do anything else. Okay, thank you, clear. Welcome, thank you. Uh, yes, Sam, to be able to answer your question, yes, uh, we can say Argo CD item potent. So that is the problem in imperative way. So if I run a comment, okay, if I run, run a comment on Kubernetes cluster, it is one time. Let's say I run a pot, I create the pot, kubectl run dash dash image, you give some image name and you give your pot name. And if I run this imperative command second time, it will shout and it will say, hey, this pop is already created. But in this declarative way, with this manifest configuration, we want to create item potency. Item potency means whatever I am changing on the cluster, it should get back to the same state, the desired state what I have. If I do the same operation, it should not affect. If it is not changed, it should not affect. Yes, this is Argo CD is helping us to keep item potency. Uh, Kimani, I, do, I didn't understand your question. Can you also do, yeah, welcome Sam. Can you also do a git uh, to separate a bug in code before commit? Yes, yeah, you can. Can you clarify your question, Kimani? Maybe he's gone. Okay, do you do you have any other questions? I think no. I think that's it, uh, Murak. Yeah. That's Thank it. you for your presentation and uh, for this very big audience. Thank and, you very uh, much. In the peak, it was six, 75 uh, students. So you did great. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, are you available for a call tomorrow? Can I call you tomorrow? Uh, yes, we can have a discussion. Thank you, Michael. So, yeah, I hope we see each other in other webinars. Technical things. So. Yes, educations. Thank you very much again, Peter, for arranging this session. Yeah, I wish everyone a good evening, good morning. I don't know where you are located and living. See you. Okay, see you. Bye. Bye bye.